Hello again, A-level students, and welcome back. So if you have not already seen the previous video to this, which would be EQ1 of Coastal Landscapes and Change, please stop here and go and watch that one first. So this is EQ2 of Coastal Landscapes and Change, and this is looking at the characteristics of coastal landforms. A reminder that there is a revision booklet that goes alongside these videos and PowerPoints that you could fill in as we go along and they will be useful for your revision. And another reminder that this is not a replacement for what you have done in lessons. It's not detailed enough to get you through an A-level exam, but it is a reminder of all of the things you have done in lessons and all of the key content to add to your wider reading and your own revision. So let's make a start then with the basics in EQ2 that shape landforms. So they are constructive and destructive waves. So constructive waves are low energy. They're generally flat. They have a long wavelength. They're low frequency and they have a strong swash pushing sediment up the beach and a weak backwash. So deposition occurs on the beach. Whereas destructive waves are high energy, large wave heights, short wave length, high wave frequency. Little energy is lost from destructive waves. And there's a strong backwash which carries materials back down the beach towards the sea. Now, erosional processes are very important. And you can see on the left here, I've got the four main processes of erosion. They are hydraulic action, abrasion, attrition, and corrosion. Now on this table, you're gonna have an explanation of what each of those are, how they influence rock type, and what the influence of the waves is as well. So let's start with hydraulic action. This is the force of the water itself causing rocks to break away. So it's actually the power of the water. And um, weak rocks like boulder clay erode easily because of hydraulic action, because it attacks the joints of the rocks which are generally magma cooled and it weakens their structure. And high energy waves with a large wave height are most effective for hydraulic action at eroding rocks, such as destructive waves. Now, abrasion involves waves picking up the rocks and throwing them against other rocks. So it chips away at a rock structure. Softer rocks like mudstones or clays or chalk are most vulnerable to abrasion. And again, this is most effective in destructive wave types. Attrition is where transported material in the sea bashes against each other whilst in the sea, not against the cliffside. And that rounds the shape and reduces the size of the rock. Again, softer rocks like sandstones and chalks and clay are broken down very quickly through attrition process. And this occurs in the swash and backwash zone of a beach where the waves break against the sand. And finally, corrosion then. This is where rocks dissolve because of their minerals in the sea and turn into solution. Now, carbonate rocks such as limestones and sedimentary rocks are easily eroded because they have enough chemicals in them to react with the seawater. And this is most effective in constructive waves because force is not really applicable here. We don't really need to think about the strength of the wave. We're thinking more about the length of the wave and also how long it's in the water. So that's a brief roundup of how important erosional processes are to the influence the types of rocks. Now, a brief recap of your erosional landforms. So the first one is a wave cut platform on the left. Now, an example of this is called Kimmeridge Bay, and that's Dorset in the southwest of England. And a wave cut platform is essentially where waves, as on this image, attack the bottom of a cliff, creating a wave cut notch. And over time, what happens is you get this flat area, which is a wave cut platform in front of the cliff where the cliff once was. And you can see where the cliff has retreated over time here. And this occurs in the high and low tide zone. And you can see that denoted by the arrow on screen, the wave attack zone. So this is a process of all of the erosional processes we looked at previously, continuously chipping away at the bottom of the cliff. And of course, what happens is the cliff retreats over time. And a lot like in a waterfall, the rock above the wave cut notch collapses as well 
at a certain point when it doesn't have enough structure to hold it there. The second type of erosional landform you had were caves, arches, stacks, and stumps. So a cave starts with a crack inside of a headland because of the erosional processes. The crack starts to grow into a cave, which is one-sided. It doesn't go right through the headland. And hydraulic action and abrasion and attrition and so on continue to chip away inside that cave until essentially the cave breaks through the other side of the headland, as you can see in number four on screen. And then what you have is a high arched cave, essentially, that is moving upward towards the top of the headland and is also widening as well. And that eventually leads to this arch collapsing, leaving behind a tall rock, such as this one, which is called a stack. And a stack erodes over time due to all the erosional processes, particularly the sea, the sea waves, chipping away at this rock as well, but also weathering on the top. And that leads to eventually a smaller rock leap being left behind called a stump. And the best known example of this in the UK is the Old Harry Rocks Cave Arch Stack and Stump in Swanage. So that's a roundup of your erosional landforms. Now, let's move on to sediment transportation influences. What influences how much sediment is transported at a coastline? So first of all is the direction of the waves controlled by wind. If the wind blows directly onshore at 90 degrees, then all of the sediment will wash up and down the beach. It will basically stay in its original position. It won't move very much apart from up and down. Longshore drift is when it's not at 90 degrees. So, for example, 30 degrees or 45 degrees to the beach. And you've done longshore drift at GCSE as well. So this is the zigzag movement. Um, of sediment along a beach because the prevailing wind direction is at a angle to the beach and that pushes sediment along the beach. We then have current, so the actual current of the water flow. So this is the flow of water in particular direction. It can be driven by wind fetch, how long the wind has been traveling over the sea and dragging the waves with it. It can also be influenced by density of water, temperature, and how much salt is present in the water. Currents transport material in a variety of ways. The global thermohaline circulation system is an example globally of how currents can move sediment. So certain currents are stronger, so move more sediment than others. And finally, we have tides. And obviously, tides change due to the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun. These tides can create currents near the uh, side of the beach, in the near shore and offshore area, and may transport sediment. So the tides can also transport sediment, whether it be high or low tide, at different times of the day. So they are the four influences of transportation of sediment. Now, those actual processes of transportation are really simple, and they're as follows. So we have traction, which is the largest boulders, and they're being rolled along the riverbed or the seabed. Then we have saltation, where those boulders become smaller and can bounce along the seabed. We then have suspension, and this is where the tiny bits of rock that have been eroded away are suspended in the sea water. And we finally have solution, where, for example, sandstone is dissolved in the river or the sea, and is now just carried as a chemical. So they are the four basic processes of transporting material. Deposition landforms. So these are a list on the left of all of the types of dep depositional landforms you could have. So spits, bayhead beaches, tombolos, bars, hooked, curved spits, and cuspate. Portlands. So what I'm going to do is run through how they're created, an explanation of them. And you can see on the right hand side already there, there are examples of where you can find these. Most of them are in the south and southwest of England, as you can see. So let's start with a spit. That is essentially a beach extended off a headland caused by longshore drift. Sediment builds up over time and continues to add to the length of the beach. The 
prevailing wind and the longshore drift continues to push the sand off of the headland and it creates an extension out of it. Essentially, it extends the beach. Now, a bayhead beach is a beach which is found in bays and it's produced by material deposited because of weak constructive waves. The swash pushes the sediment up on the beach, but the backwash is really weak, so it doesn't pull it back down with it. Tombolos then are bars. So it basically is a bar that connects two sides of a landscape together. So for example, it can be a bar that connects two headlands. And what happens is that cuts off an area of the sea behind that bar, which eventually dries out and may become a salt or mud marsh. A bar itself then is essentially where that sand, could be from a spit, joins across a bay, joins two sides of a landscape together. A hooked or curved spit is very simply, like in the first one we explained, an actual spit, but this is where essentially the wind direction has changed while the spit is being formed and it pushes the sediment or the sand in a different direction so it forms almost like a curved hand shape or a hook shape. And finally, a cuspate foreland. And this one is a low-lying triangular shaped headland that extends out from a shoreline and it's formed again by deposited material. It's caused by longshore drift working in opposite directions. So you may have changing prevailing winds. It might be going east and then west and east and then west and so on. And what it does is it pushes the sand towards the headland in a triangular shape. So another key aspect of what you've learned in coasts is sediment cells. And you can see an image on the top right there of all of the sediment cells of the UK. Now, these are essentially zones that you can section the UK's coastline into, particularly England and Wales, to show different processes in each of those sections. So a sediment cell is a linked system and it involves the source transfer and sink of material. So where it comes from, how it's moved and where it drops. Sediment cell is an example of what's called a dynamic equilibrium system. It's a balance between what's being added to the cell, the amount of sand going into it, and what's coming out of it, what's being removed. So a good example to use here is the east coast of England around the Holderness area. For example, uh, the cell sees the sand come from Flamborough Head and then it moves towards the Holderness coast and it sinks at Spurn Head. OK, so what you see is that southward movement of the sand because of longshore drift from Flamborough Head down to the Holderness coast and leaving deposited behind at Spurn Head. Now, examples of inputs, what actually adds sand into the cells? Cliff erosion, currents, transport from rivers, wind being blown and pushing the sediment onto that part of a beach, subaerial processes and the breakdown of rock and also marine organisms. So these are all the things that add sand or sediment to an area. Transfers then, transfers then what actually moves the sediment, longshore drift, swash and backwash, tidal currents, ocean currents and wind. They're the main things that move the sediment. And then examples of sink. What happens when the sediment is deposited? So we have what's called landforms on the shore like sand dunes. We have foreshore landforms like beaches. We have nearshore landforms like bars and we have offshore landforms like barrier islands. So these are all different depending on where they are. Inland, you'll find the sand dunes and the furthest out towards sea, you'll find the barrier islands. So they're the types of things that can be formed due to this example of sinking sediment. So that is sediment cells. And within sediment cells, we also have what's called negative and positive feedback. Now, negative feedback is when the change produced creates effects that operate to reduce or work against the original change. So, for example, major erosion of sand dunes may lead to deposition, creating an offshore bar, 
which reduces wave energy and therefore protecting the sand dunes and allowing them time to recover. So the sand dune has led to deposition at the sea. That creates a bar at the sea and that actually protects the sand dune and allows it to build back up. So that is negative feedback. Now, positive feedback is when the change produced has an effect that increases the original change. So, for example, wind erodes sand dunes and removes the vegetation. Further wind erosion later will increase depletion of that sand dune, so it won't go back to its original position. Negative feedback allows the sand dune, for example, to go back to its original position to build back up. Positive feedback won't. It will further deplete the source, it will further degrade it. Okay, let's move on to weathering then. Now, you did these at GCSE as well. And just a reminder, weathering, unlike erosion, is the breakdown of rock in situ. And in situ means the rock remains in one position, it does not move. Everything else moves around it, it's atmospheric mainly, but the rock itself does not move. So we had three types. We have physical, otherwise known as mechanical, and this is force on a rock, so like freeze-thaw weathering, where water gets into the crack of a rock, it freezes, it expands the rock, and it further cracks it. We also have, within mechanical weathering, salt crystal growth. Near a sea, for example, salt from the air and the sea water gets into the cracks of the rock, puts pressure on the rock inside, and slowly breaks its structure down. And we also have wetting and drying processes. And an example of this is very simply rain, dry, rain, dry, and that continual process. Clay, for example, if it's repeatedly wetted and then dried, expands and contracts and it starts to crumble. So they are your basic mechanical weathering processes. Chemical weathering is all about chemical reaction. So it's chemicals within a rock that react in, con in contact with water and break the rock down. So carbonation carbon in limestone breaking down due to rainwater. Hydrolysis is about the breakdown of minerals to form new ones. So carbon dioxide, for example, can break down uh, to create feldspar in granite. And then oxidation, you may have heard of this term before, is also a type of chemical weathering. And this is where oxygen coming into contact with minerals causes the rock to break down, for example, sandstone. And finally, we have biological weathering. This is the easiest. This is where plants and animals come into contact with rock and affect its structure. So tree root weathering, for example, where tree roots can crack concrete and brick and other types of rock forcing it apart. You may have seen this on a street where trees are growing and the concrete starts to break away around it. And we also have rock boring where some animals and species can actually bore into a rock, particularly soft ones like clay, and degrade its structure. So they are the three big processes of weathering. Now, we're moving into the final stages here of EQ2, and we also looked in EQ2 at mass movement. So what is it, first of all? Very simply, it's the downslope movement of material because of gravity. So it's when material like soil, rocks, and so on move down a slope due to gravity. So that includes things like landslides, rotational slumping, and rockfall. But the type of mass movement depends on the lithology, depends on the type of rock present. So if it's unconsolidated material, material that's not really well binded together, like sand, slumping will take place. But if it's more consolidated rock, rocks that are binded together, hard rock, you will see sliding taking place. So it won't slump downward, it will slide instead. So let's go through rockfall. Now, rockfall occurs on slopes over 40 degrees. So the slope has to be quite steep, like in the image on the right. What you see is rock or fragments of the rock breaking away and dropping vertically to the bottom or whole chunks, like in the image on the right. Now, freeze-thaw weathering and salt crystals and hydraulic action and abrasion and all of those sea processes and weathering processes all weaken the rock, first of all. So they are what breaks it down. But then gravity obviously pulls it down as it's no longer able to hold its structure. 
Now, cliffs that are more prone to this rock fall problem generally have a structure that has many joints and folds. So you can see on this image, there's lots of lines. There's lots of joints in this rock that bind it together, but not very successfully after the weathering that's taken place. Steep cliffs, now you can see here that these cliffs are mainly at a 90 degree angle upward. So they're gonna be prone to it. And earthquake prone areas as well are very prone to seeing lots of rockfall. Landslides. Now landslides uh, is the downslope movement of blocks of rock down a hill, even though they can be relatively flat slopes. And all of the material maintains contact with the ground at all times. So it doesn't dramatically fall down, it slowly creeps down. Chemical weathering causes this, and so does general weathering processes like freeze-thaw. It can also be caused by marine erosion at the foot of a cliff, so it can be caused by the erosional processes in the sea. And also heavy rain and rainstorms encourage landslides because it adds weight and moisture to the land, which as you can see in this image is what has happened. Over time, this side of the landscape has become very wet and eroded, and so eventually it's just started to slip downhill. Finally, rotational slumping. So as you can see here, this involves the rotation or the circular movement of land and soil downhill. So it involves the failure of the rock structure and the rock moves down along a curved rock plane. It's slower than rockfall. It's not immediate. It can take years for large masses to move. And it occurs in weaker rocks like clays, sands and boulder clay, and also where rock is very permeable, where rock allows water to pass through it. The rock moves in a rotational manner, as I said before, so you can see in this image just how these three bands of rock are moving in a circular manner along the bottom of, of the bed of the rock. Now, landforms that are made by mass movement. Let's start with rockfall very briefly. We have lots of scree being deposited at the bottom of the rockfall. Scree is essentially broken away rock from the main cliff, okay? And what you can get is what's called a talus scree slope. It's a fan-shaped mound of material. It literally looks like a fan from overhead. And an example of this is in the South Dorset coast in the southwest of England, where 80 meter section of chalk cliff was detached overnight and that created a large fan-shaped talus scree slope and that extends 30 meters into the sea. So you can get what are called talus scree slopes, which is just essentially a lot of deposited material at the bottom of a cliff in a fan shape. A rotational slumping can cause what's called a rotational scar. And this is just a scar on the landscape from where the land and sand and rock once was. So that leaves a scar on the landscape behind it. And that is everything you need to be aware of in a brief summary for EQ2 of Coastal Landscapes and Change. The next jog pod will look at EQ3 of Coastal Landscapes and Change, particularly focusing on sea level change and coastal erosion and how that increases the risk to coastlines. So please do go and check that out. Hopefully you found this useful. And if you've got any questions, please do ask your geography teacher.